The Lives of the Dead, Part 2, pages 223 through 233. It's now 1990. I'm 43 years old, which would have seemed impossible to a fourth grader. And yet when I look at photographs of myself as I was in 1956, I realize that in the important ways I haven't changed at all. I was Timmy then, now I'm Tim, but the essence remains the same. I'm not fooled by the baggy pants, or the crew cut, or the happy smile. I know my own eyes, and there is no doubt that the Timmy smiling at the camera is the Tim I am now. Inside the body, or beyond the body, there is something absolute and unchanging. The human life is all one thing, like a blade tracing loops on ice. A little kid, a twenty-three-year-old infantry sergeant, a middle-aged writer knowing guilt and sorrow. And as a writer now, I want to save Linda's life. Not her body, her life. She died, of course. Nine years old and she died. It was a brain tumor. She lived through the summer and into the first part of September, and then she was dead. But in a story I can steal her soul. I can revive, at least briefly, that which is absolute and unchanging. In a story, miracles can happen. Linda can smile and sit up. She can reach out, touch my wrist, and say, Timmy, stop crying. I needed that kind of miracle. At some point, I'd come to understand that Linda was sick, maybe even dying. But I loved her and just couldn't accept it. In the middle of the summer, I remember, my mother tried to explain to me about brain tumors. Now and then, she said, bad things start growing inside us. Sometimes you can cut them out, and other times you can't. And for Linda, it was one of the times when you can't. I thought about it for several days. All right, I finally said. So will she get better now? Well, no, my mother said. I don't think so. She stared at a spot behind my shoulder. Sometimes people don't ever get better. They die sometimes. I shook my head. Not Linda, I said. But on a September afternoon, during noon recess, Nick Vinoff came up to me on the school playground. Your girlfriend, he said, she kicked the bucket. At first I didn't understand. She's dead, he said. My mom told me at lunchtime. No lie, she actually kicked the god dang bucket. All I could do was nod. Somehow it didn't quite register. I turned away, glanced down at my hands for a second, and then walked home without telling anyone. It was a little after one o'clock, I remember, and the house was empty. I drank some chocolate milk and then lay down on the sofa in the living room, not really sad, just floating, trying to imagine what it was to be dead. Nothing came to me. I remember closing my eyes and whispering her name, almost begging, trying to make her come back. Linda, I said, please. And then I concentrated. I willed her alive. It was a dream, I suppose, or a daydream, but I made it happen. I saw her coming down the middle of Main Street, all alone. It was nearly dark and the street was deserted. No cars or people, and Linda wore a pink dress and shiny black shoes. I remember sitting down on the curb to watch. All her hair had grown back. The scars and stitches were gone. In the dream, if that's what it was, she was playing a game, sort of, laughing and running up the empty street kicking a big aluminum water bucket. Right then I started to cry. After a moment Linda stopped and carried her water bucket over to the curb and asked why I was so sad. Well, God, I said, you're dead. Linda nodded at me. She was standing under a yellow street light, a nine-year-old girl, just a kid, and yet there was something ageless in her eyes, not a child, not an adult. Just a bright, ongoing everness. That same pinprick of absolute lasting light that I see today in my own eyes as Timmy. I smiled at Tim from the graying photographs of that time. Dead, I said. Linda smiled. It was a secret smile, as if she knew things nobody could ever know. She reached out and touched my wrist and said, Timmy, stop crying. It doesn't matter. In Vietnam, too, we had ways of making the dead seem not quite so dead. Shaking hands, that was one way. 
by sliding death, by acting, we pretended it was not the terrible thing it was. By our language, which we was both hard and wistful, we transformed the bodies into piles of waste. Thus, when someone got killed, as Kurt Lehman did, his body was not really a body, but rather one small bit of waste in the midst of a much wider wa wastage. I learned that words make a difference. It's easier to cope with a kicked bucket than a corpse. If it isn't human, it doesn't matter much if it's dead. And so a VC nurse, fried by napalm, was a crispy critter. A Vietnamese baby, which lay nearby, was a roasted peanut. Just a crunchy munchy, Rat Kylie said as he stepped over the body. We kept the dead alive with stories. When Ted Lavender was shot in the head, the men talked about how they'd never seen him so mellow. How tranquil he was. How it wasn't the bullet, but the tranquilizers that blew his mind. He wasn't dead, just laid back. There were Christians among us, like Hyla, who believed in the New Testament stories of life after death. Other stories were passed down like legends from old-timer to newcomer. Mostly, though, we had to make up our own. Often they were exaggerated or blatant lies, but it was a way of bringing body and soul back together, or a way of making new bodies for the souls to inhabit. There was a story, for instance, about how Kurt Lemon had gone trick-or-treating on Halloween, a dark, spooky night, and so Lemon put on a ghost mask and painted up his body all different colors, and crept across a paddy to a sleeping village. Almost stark naked, the story went, just boots and balls and an M-16. And in the dark, Lemon went from hooch to hooch, ringing doorbells, he called it. Then a few hours later, when he slipped back into the perimeter, he had a whole sack full of goodies to share with his pals. Candles and jaw sticks, and a pair of black pajamas, and statuettes of the smiling Buddha, that was the story, anyway. Other versions were much more elaborate, full of descriptions and scraps of dialogue. Rat Kylie liked to spice it up with extra details. See, what happens is, it's like four in the morning, and Lemon sneaks into a hooch with that weird ghost mask on. Everybody's asleep, right? So he wakes up this cute little Mama-san, tickles her foot. Hey, Mama-san, he goes real soft like, Hey, Mama-san, trick or treat. Should have seen her face. About freaks. I mean, there's this buck-naked ghost standing there. He's got this M-16 up right against her ear, and he whispers, Hey, Mama-san, trick or treat. Then he takes off her PJs, strips her right down, sticks the pajamas in his sack, and tucks her into bed and heads for the next hooch. Pausing a moment, Rat Kylie would grin and shake his head. Honest to God, he'd murmur, trick or treat. Lemon, there's one class act. To listen to the story, especially as Rat Kylie told it, he'd never know that Kurt Lemon was dead. He was still out there in the dark, naked and painted up, trick-or-treating, sliding from hooch to hooch in the crazy white ghost mask. But he was dead. In September, the day after Linda died, I asked my father to take me down to Benson's funeral home to view the body. I was a fifth grader then, and I was curious. On the drive downtown, my father kept his eyes straight ahead. At one point, I remember, he made a scratchy sound in his throat. It took a long time to light up a cigarette. Timmy, he said, you're sure about this? I nodded at him. Down inside, of course, I wasn't sure, and yet I had to see her one more time. What I needed, I suppose, was some sort of final confirmation, something to carry with me after she was gone. When he parked in front of the funeral home, my father turned and looked at me. If this bothers you, he said, just say the word and we'll make a quick getaway, fair enough? Okay, I said. Or if you start to feel sick or anything, I won't, I told him. Inside, the first thing I noticed was the smell, thick and sweet, like something sprayed out of a can. The viewing room was empty except for Linda and my father and me. I felt a rush of panic as we walked up the aisle. The smell made me dizzy. I tried to fight it off, slowing down a little, taking short, shallow breaths through my mouth, but at the same time I felt a funny excitement, anticipation in a way. The same awkward feeling as when I'd walked up to the sidewalk to ring her doorbell on our first date. I wanted to impress her. I wanted something to happen between us, a secret signal of some sort. The room was dimly lighted, almost dark. 
But at the far end of the aisle, Linda's white casket was illuminated by a row of spotlights up in the ceiling. Everything was quiet. My father put his hand on my shoulder, whispered something, and backed off. After a moment, I edged forward a few steps, pushing up on my toes for a better look. It didn't seem real. A mistake, I thought. The girl lying in the white casket wasn't Linda. There was a resemblance, maybe. For where Linda had always been very slender and fragile-looking, almost skinny, the body in the casket was fat and swollen. For a second I wondered if somebody made a terrible blunder, a technical mistake, pumped her too full of formaldehyde or embalming fluid or whatever they used. Her arms and face were bloated. The skin at her cheeks was stretched out tight like the rubber skin on a balloon just before it pops open. Even her fingers seemed puffy. I turned and glanced behind me. Where my father stood, thinking that maybe it was a joke, hoping it was a joke, almost believing that Linda would jump out from behind one of the curtains and laugh and yell at my name. But she didn't. The room was silent. When I looked back at the casket, I felt dizzy again. In my heart, I'm sure I knew this was Linda. But even so, I couldn't find much to recognize. I tried to pretend she was taking a nap, her hands folded on her stomach, just sleeping away the afternoon. Except she didn't look asleep. She looked dead. She looked heavy and totally dead. I remember closing my eyes. After a while, my father stepped up beside me. Come on now, he said. Let's go get some ice cream. In the months after Ted Lavender died, there were many other bodies. I never shook hands, not that. But one afternoon I climbed a tree and threw down what was left of Kurt Lemon. I watched my friend, Kiowa, sink into the muck along the Song Trabong. And in early July, after a battle in the mountains, I was assigned to a six-man detail to police up the enemy KIAs. There were twenty-seven bodies altogether, and parts of several others. The dead were everywhere. Some lay in piles, some lay alone. One, I remember, seemed to kneel. Another was bent from the waist over a small boulder. The top of his head on the ground, his arms rigid, the eyes squinting in concentration as if he were about to perform a handstand or a somersault. It was my worst day at the war. For three hours we carried the bodies down the mountain to a clearing alongside a narrow dirt road. We had lunch there. Then a truck pulled up and we worked in two-man teams to load the truck. I remember swinging the bodies up. Mitchell Sanders took a man's feet, I took the arms and we counted to three, working up momentum, and then we tossed the body high and watched it bounce and come to rest among the other bodies. The dead had been dead for more than a day. They were badly, bo badly bloated. Their clothing was stretched tight like sausage skins, and when we picked them up, some made sharp burping sounds as the gases were released. They were heavy. Their feet were bluish-green and cold. The smell was terrible. At one point, Mitchell Sanders looked at me and said, Hey, man, I just realized something. What? He wiped his eyes and spoke very quietly, as if awed by his own wisdom. Death sucks, he said. Laying in bed at night, I make up elaborate stories to bring Linda alive in my sleep. I invented my own dreams. It sounds impossible, I know, but I did it. I'd pictured somebody's birthday party, a crowded room, I'd think of a big chocolate cake and pink candles, and then soon I'd be dreaming it, and after a while Linda would show up, as I knew she would, but in the dream we'd look at each other and not talk much, because we were shy, but then later I'd walk her home, and we'd sit on the front steps and stare at the dark and just be together. She'd say amazing things sometimes. Once you're alive, she'd say, you can't ever be dead, or she'd say, do I look dead? It was kind of a self-hypnosis, partly willpower, partly faith, which is how stories arrive. But back then it felt like a miracle. My dreams had become a secret meeting place, and in the weeks after she died I couldn't wait to fall asleep at night. I began going to bed earlier and earlier, sometimes even in bright daylight. My mother, I remember, finally asked me, asked me about it at breakfast one morning. Timmy, what's wrong? she said. But all I could do was shrug and say, Nothing. I just need sleep, that's all. I didn't dare tell the truth. It was embarrassing, I suppose. 
but it was also a precious secret like a magic trick where if I tried to explain it or even talk about it the thrill and mystery would be gone I didn't want to lose Linda she was dead I understood that after all I'd seen her body yet yeah, even as a nine-year-old I began I had begun to practice the magic of stories some I just dreamed up others I wrote down the scenes and dialogue and at night time I'd slide into sleeping knowing that Linda would be there waiting for me once, I remember, we went ice skating late at night, tracing loops and circles under the yellow floodlights. Later, we sat by a wood stove in the warming house, all alone, and after a while I asked her what it was like to be dead. Apparently, Linda thought it was a silly question. She smiled and said, Do I look dead? I told her no. She looked terrific. I waited a moment, then asked again, and Linda made a soft little sigh. I could smell our wool mittens drying on the stove. For a few seconds she was quiet. Well, right now, she said, I'm not dead. But when I am, it's like, I don't know, I guess it's like being inside a book that nobody's reading. A book, I said. An old one. It's up on a library shelf, so you're safe and everything, but the book hasn't been checked out for a long, long time. All you can do is wait. Just hope somebody will pick it up and start reading. Linda smiled at me. Anyhow, it's not bad, she said. I mean, when you're dead, you just have to be yourself. She stood up and put on her red stocking cap. This is stupid. Let's go skate some more. So I followed her down to the frozen pond. It was late, and nobody else was there, and we held hands and skated almost all night under the yellow lights. And then it becomes 1990. I'm 43 years old and a writer now, still dreaming, Linda alive, in exactly the same way. She's not the embodied Linda. She's mostly made up with a new identity and a new name, like the man who never was. Her real name doesn't matter. She was nine years old. I loved her and then she died. And yet right here, in the spell of memory and imagination, I can still see her as if through ice, as if I'm gazing into some other world, a place where there are no brain tumors and no funeral homes where there are no bodies at all. I can see Kiowa, too, and Ted Lavender, and Kurt Lemon, but sometimes I can even see Timmy skating with Linda under the yellow floodlights. I'm young and happy. I'll never die. I'm skimming across the surface of my own history, moving fast, riding the melt beneath the blades, doing loops and spins, and when I take a high leap in the dark and come down thirty years later, I realize it is as Tim trying to save Timmy's life with a story.